Hello and welcome to Projector, and on this episode, we kick off 2021 by taking care of some unfinished business, as I review the third instalment of the Skyline franchise, Skylines. Fifteen years after the alien invasion, what remains of humanity is trying to rebuild, with those who had their brains placed in alien pilot bodies living peacefully alongside the survivors, when a virus starts making the pilots violently attack humans once again. Half-alien, half-human hybrid Rose, Pepper Lindsay Morgan and her adopted brother Trent, a pilot, played by Jeremy Fitzgerald, are assigned by General Radford, played by Alexander Siddig, to join a team of soldiers, among them Daniel Bernhard's Owens, Jonathan Howard's Leon, and Charlie Yoon Ji, to the alien home planet of Cobalt One to find a cure and save Earth once again. By all logic, Skyline shouldn't be a franchise. The original film made back in 2010, directed by the Strauss brothers, who had a pedigree in visual effects, was only made for a mere 10 million dollars, of which only 500,000 actually went towards the filming itself. The rest of it was all spent on the effects, and watching it, boy can you tell. It's basically a C-list movie with a bunch of actors spending the majority of it hiding around in an apartment during an alien invasion, occasionally spliced with genuinely impressive CGI shots and enough money moments to string together a trailer. That's what Skyline basically is. It's a pitch reel for a franchise. It's an effects reel and that's about it. And audiences and critics eviscerated the movie, rightfully so, because it's genuinely not very good. It features a whole bunch of characters doing illogical, ridiculous decisions all the way through it. And aside from the cool premise of people being sucked up in these lights, that's about it. But nevertheless, despite the fact that it was hated by virtually everyone, the budget on it was so small that it made its money back, and in fact was actually quite a big hit in Asia. But no one genuinely thought that there was actually going to be a sequel to that movie, even though it ended on a cliffhanger. And yet, seven years later, very unexpectedly, we get Beyond Skyline. On that movie, the Strauss brothers have moved into a producer role, and taking their place in the director's chair is Liam O'Donnell, who co-wrote the original film. And that movie is basically an apology for Skyline. It basically doubles the budget to $20 million, but delivers big time. All the things that Skyline promised in its original advertising, beyond Skyline, finally actually brings home. And so it feels massively expanded from its predecessor. We go inside the alien spaceships, we go around the world, and also it sees a real shift in focus. The film centers on Frank Grillo trying to protect his son during the alien invasion, and it basically acts as a soft reboot to the franchise, but it also shifts its genre. The original film was a sci-fi horror movie in the vein of something like Cloverfield. Instead, Beyond Skyline becomes this genre mixing pot. So there is some horror element still in there, but now it shifts more in favor of action as well, especially because about halfway through, they introduce cast members from The Raid, including Eco Ways. That's right, this becomes a sci-fi horror action martial arts movie. Beyond Skyline genuinely became a cult hit, enough so that there are people that are willing to defend the original film, which, trust me, didn't happen when that first came out. Now we have Skylines, or as it's stylized, Skyline Threes, which sees much of the same team from Beyond Skyline reunite, including writer and director Liam O'Donnell. But the question is, with this third outing, does it manage to expand even further on the promise that was delivered by its predecessor? Skynes is set 15 years after the first two films, and it establishes a world that's very different from our own, especially given that diverging point of the alien invasion. It's almost post-apocalyptic. Humanity is one against the aliens, but it's still trying to figure out how to recover, especially because it's now divided between the people that evaded capture from the aliens and those that had their brains harvested and put in the bodies of alien pilots, but they've managed 
to have their personalities restored. And you would think, given this very unusual societal makeup, there would be ample room for commentary about prejudice and division in the vein of like Alien Nation. But Skylines has no interest in such things. And that's one of the first real pities, because this setup has ample room for world building, but it does nothing with it. The early scenes on Earth are largely rushed through to establish a scenario and get the movie to where it actually wants to be. And what is that exactly? It wants to be aliens, in case you hadn't got that from the title and the synopsis. And that is another little pity in that I've seen a lot of Aliens clones. They were very, very common and still are. And this movie makes no secret of its influences from the fact that it has a female action hero, a team of mercenaries, to specific moments like a character being ripped in half by an alien, exactly like Bishop at the end of that movie. So... Really, it does feel quite derivative. Skylines is in no way going to be winning originality points, although, let's face it, this franchise has never won that. I will say to its defense that Skylines is not the worst Aliens ripoff I've ever seen. It's certainly better than something like Doom, for example, but it does feel like we've seen this movie before, especially in the earlier sections where it almost resembles a sci-fi TV movie of the week. O'Donnell is clearly saving all the big special effects moments for the third act, and as such, the earlier moments in the movie spend a lot of time on the spaceship in grated metal corridors and rooms that are very nondescript and a little bit cheap looking. It almost resembles the Doctor Who reboot at times, and that's not meant to be a slam on the movie itself. It's obviously working within very tight budget constraints, but it does feel like the movie is perhaps overstretching itself beyond what it can actually achieve at times. It isn't helped by the fact that this movie is extremely cheesy. This is cheese on top of cheese. This is the kind of movie where you know all the plot points in advance, you can guess them. Even the dialogue, this is an absolute storm of cliches from the genre. What I will say about the Skyline franchise, more so the sequels, is that they know exactly what they are. They are B-movies through and through, and as such, they have to deliver on the promise of being trashily entertaining. And they do. I think that Skylines is a bit less successful at that than Beyond Skyline, but even so, if you're in the market for some trashy, disposable, schlocky sci-fi entertainment, then Skyline has got you covered. I also think that the Skyline franchise has always been an attempt to try and do the big budget sci-fi blockbuster on a fraction of the cost. And I think considering the limitations that they have, it's genuinely impressive how much they've managed to throw up on screen. There's loads and loads of effects work, especially in the later two movies, and that really is quite inspiring to a certain extent. But also there's something about this series that's a bit kind of homebrew and rough around the edges that gives it a charm about it. And also, it knows that it's not taking itself too seriously. This is a series where the last two entries have had blooper reels in the closing credits. That's so rare to see, but it punctures any pomposity that the films might have given over their running time. It's certainly a stark contrast to a lot of the competitors that it's running up against that all too often feel like they're a bit po-faced. And considering that Skylines has managed to have more longevity than something like Independence Day, which promised a sequel that will probably never ever happen, I think that is quite impressive. I think that's almost worthy of applause, even if the films themselves are rather deeply flawed, if we're being somewhat charitable. And that spirit can be felt all throughout the film, especially in the way that it carries itself with a weird kind of earnestness and sincerity about it. Perhaps this is best illustrated by the relationship between Rose and Trent, which is a very odd brother-sister dynamic if I ever saw it, in that Rose is a half-alien, half-human hybrid that has accelerated aging, and Trent 
is a human in a pilot body who has distorted dialogue that is translated in the subtitles and they communicate with each other like they're Han Solo and Chewbacca. And while I'm on the subject of the subtitles, why are Trent's lines inconsistently censored when this is an R-rated movie? Nevertheless though, the movie expects you to take this relationship at face value, it wants you to be emotionally invested in it. Trent is a returning character from Beyond Skyline, and that's kind of odd, considering that one side of this equation is a guy in a rubber suit on stilts that can express no emotion in his face, and yet the movie wants you to buy that, and that's kind of sweet in its own way. Rose as a character is greatly expanded here. She was in Beyond Skyline, but she more functioned as a deus ex machina and was ridiculous ridiculously overpowered. The filmmakers try to elaborate on the character here and try to give her some weaknesses so that she isn't trying to just take on the aliens one-handed, essentially. And Lindsay Morgan returns from the final scene of Beyond Skyline to reprise her role. You might be familiar with her from the TV series The 100. And she carries herself perfectly well in the part but I do think that the character as written is nothing more than a generic sci-fi action heroine. We've seen a lot of characters like this, and Rose doesn't particularly stand out. And it's a pity the filmmakers don't follow through on one of the most interesting conceits in that Rose actually has her alien side take over. And you would think the filmmakers would take full advantage of this twist and invert the audience's expectations and actually have Rose as the antagonist for a good chunk of the running time, a properly formidable foe for the team to go up against. And instead, it's discarded about 10 minutes and quickly resolved. And they could have done so much more with that. It would have made Rose as a character more nuanced and more unpredictable. And instead she sits a bit too close to being generic. What I genuinely missed in this outing was Frank Grillo. He helped ground the previous entry. There are some ridiculous things that happen in Beyond Skyline, but you believe them because Grillo's there and he feels credible. Obviously, Grillo couldn't appear in this movie due to a scheduled conflict, and as such, his character has been effectively written out. He's mysteriously gone missing between films. And so Grillo gets a credit here, but it's for archive footage due to flashbacks to the previous film. And because of that, that only makes it more keenly felt how the fact that he's absent means that the movie doesn't really have a relatable everyman character. We don't relate to Rose in the same way that we did Grillo's cop, purely because she's just so super-powered. The supporting cast is very much a mixed bag here, especially because the team of soldiers is largely made up of martial arts stars who definitely cannot act. What I will say, though, is that Alexander Siddig knows what movie he's in. He knows that his character has to deliver all the big exposition and then in the third act gets to camp it up royally. Siddig is chewing on the scenery mercilessly and you know what? He looks like he's having a lot of fun doing that. The problem with this movie, though, is a lot of the bigger names in the supporting cast, or at least the most recognisable ones, are largely sidelined back on Earth because there's a parallel storyline where Rona Mitra's doctor is trying to find a cure for the pilot's disease while trying to fend off hordes of pilots that are attacking the refugee camp that they're in. James Cosmo is also among the refugees. You've got Yayan Rorian reprising his role from Beyond Skyline. Only this time he's got alien limbs, but his role is basically a cameo. He didn't exactly have the biggest part in the last movie, but here he's in it for about two minutes. And while having his character back with a fresh set of limbs is quite funny, especially if you've seen the previous film, 
It feels like a real waste of him to have him back that briefly, especially because this whole subplot does nothing but really pad out the movie. Nothing of great significance happens here other than just to break up the action on the alien planet. And while it does give Rona Mitra in particular a lot of chances to just exploit her action persona, it's to no real end. But this also speaks to a larger issue in the the movie doesn't know what to do with the martial arts element that was introduced in Beyond Skyline, and as such, it's not really felt aside from the first five minutes and the last act. And it does feel like a way to get a lot of martial artists in your cast and then force them to act for a good chunk of your running time. Daniel Bernard is not a good actor, but once they finally allow him to let loose, he does deliver a couple of fairly impressive fight scenes. And I do think that last act in general sums up a lot of the problems with Skyline as a franchise in that it favours this kitchen sink approach of throw everything at the screen and see what sticks. Sometimes that works to its benefit, but then you'll get other things that feel underdeveloped and not properly thought through. What I will say about Skylines is that the script here isn't really any better or worse than the big budget fare that it's trying to emulate, but it falls into the same trap, especially in the climax, which is ludicrously overstuffed. There are three separate fight scenes going on in this hangar, and it becomes a virtual wall of noise and special effects. It's very hard to keep track of. The music is really bombastic. It feels like sensory overload, and it just could have been simplified. It feels like too much on the screen, and it threatens to become completely overwhelming, and not in a good way. I don't think Skylines is a good movie per se, but I was entertained by it to an extent. If you liked Beyond Skyline, chances are you'll also like Skylines as well, and if you've been missing big budget sci-fi fare, this might well fill a hole for you. If you've been holding a grudge for Skyline, it might actually be worth giving the series another shot, especially considering that Skylines is almost completely unrecognisable from the movie that it originated from. The sequels are very different animals, and I do commend the filmmakers for keeping on expanding the franchise. That is genuinely quite impressive, especially considering the limitations of their budget. What I will say is that the movie does end in traditional Skyline fashion with yet another cliffhanger for a further instalment, but I had a sense of cautious optimism about that, because there is a weird enthusiasm here that's hard to dislike, and as such, you do genuinely wonder what kind of craziness would they be able to offer up next? If you like this review and you want to support my work, then you can do so over at my Ko-fi page, or you can blast off over to my Patreon, where you can see my reviews early, among other perks, including access to my Discord server. But until next time, I'm Matthew Burke, fading out. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>